And now moving on to issues related to combining predictions with observations. And this little set of green, red, and, and blue lines and circles, uh, we're going to use this uh, diagram to go over that issue. Um, in red, we have one track. And that's the predict, predicted position based on past measurements. Okay. And here we have the filtered estimate of position. And here we have, the, in green, the true position of the target. So we have a difference between the predicted position based on past estimates back here and the filtered position which says the target should be here. So they're a little different. And we have a cloud of uncertainty in the new measurements for the new measurements and the observed position from the new measurement with low signal to noise ratio. And we have the issue of where do we want to put, or do we want to associate the, the detection, the observed detection. Now, what we've done here is we've changed the observed position from the, from the new measurement is at high signal-to-noise ratio, not low. And that would say that it is a lot better, it's a lot closer, and the high signal-to-noise ratio means the cloud of uncertainty in the new measurement is smaller. So it says that, well, this is the filtered position estimate and this is the true path, so that but we don't see that. It seems, gee, this is what you'd pick as easily. If we go back for a moment, the filtered position, when, the, when this has low, measure, low signal to noise ratio, you'd expect it to be over here based on the uncertainty for the new prediction, not using this data to filter. So you can see how using the filtered estimates of the position and this would be the filtered position based upon this measurement also would give you a different answer. And clearly what it says is you want as high a signal-to-noise ratio on your observation as possible that will give you the best and, and, and the most accurate estimate of the true path, of, true path of the target that you have with the data. But there's uncertainties to all of these. Now, now to the next issue in our overall uh, looking at the track tracking functions. Track files and updating. A master ca a track file is kept of all tracks that have been initiated. I mentioned that earlier. A track file usually contains the following information. Not only position, amplitude, and Doppler velocity if it's available for each detection and their time tags. It'll contain the smooth position and velocity information and the predicted p position and velocity information at the, at the time of the next track update. And there'll also be a track firmness, which is a measure of the de detection quality. And after detection is associated with a track, the file is all updated again. And sequentially, it, 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 uh, keeps going. Now we, this is the, the function of track termination is obviously 
when we can don't see the track anymore to end the end the track. But data might be missing just for a scan or so, and the target might may be coasted uh, on some uh, digital displays. A question mark rather than a track mark will be displayed, saying we didn't get any data, but we think it's probably there. And in many occasions, since Radar targets don't have a probability of detection of one. You will coast from one scan to the to the say from the ith to the ith minus two scan, and then pick it up clean again. If data is missing from a number of scans, then the track will be terminated. Now the criteria for ter terminating a track is going to vary on all different types of radars. Uh, in Merrill Skolnick, he suggests that if three scans um, uh, are used to establish a track, then five consecutive missed detections are a reasonable criteria for track termination. For a high value target, such as a, ski, a sea skimming missile or a uh, ballistics, uh, uh, ballistic missile warhead coming towards a city uh, or, heading to, or, or a sea skimmer heading towards a ship, uh, different approaches would probably be taken. Now, for track wall scan radars, where you have the antenna rotating, uh, the data in the 360 degrees is divided up into wedges, sectors they're called. And the co what we do is correlate uh, new detections with established tracks and do the updating on a sector by sector basis. So let's start over here. And in this sec sector 12, we c collect data and then in, uh, in, in sectors 9 through 11, they're being inspected to ascertain if they're clutter false alarm areas stored in a clutter map and if so, deleted. Um, tracks association is performed in sections sectors 7 through 9, and I use to preferentially update firm tracks if association is possible. Tentative tracks are secondarily updated if the tentative, if the data gives positive association, and tentative tracks in sector 4 are established uh, on, a pro on the remaining detections if appropriate tracks are terminated. So we see we just go round and round. Keep doing that process serially. So you notice there's a delay between when the target is first detected and up to 45 degrees later, it will be declared a firm track. I'd say a firm new, uh, data added to an existing track and then initiate it as a new track even later. When, when if For the issue of phase to raise, the, the techniques uh, I went over a little bit in the block diagram in the bottom, but the tracking techniques are similar to, uh, to the ones we've already talked about. But there are some really significant advantages in tracking of phase to ray radars. You've got a flexible track update rate, higher or lower as required, as opposed to a mechanical scanning antenna with a constant antenna rotation rate. An electronic beam steering enables simultaneously tracking of multiple targets separated by many beam widths. And that's something that no way, with all the inertia and with a mechanical scanning antenna, that it can be done. And there's no closed loop feedback control of the radar beam. The computer controls the beam and the track update rate. And here are a number of radars, phased array radars, that would use these sorts of techniques. Now, not, uh, now on to the issue of correlated misdetections and correlated false alarms in the tracking process. Most trackers assume that false detections and misdetections on a target and track are uncorrelated, random, and noise-like. 
And, and that's what a lot of the track of theoreticians, when they put out the, the tracking papers, will do. Well, they'll, they'll, they won't test it with r real data. Some of them. I've, I've ran, run across quite a few papers that just assume that false alarms are random. But in fact, they are not. The theory for predicting the performance of correlated noise or mist detections is much more complex. You have to develop a very significant, complex model of what the background is or measure the phenomena that these trackers are supposed to uh, deal with. And that's very difficult to do because it, it involves taking a huge amount of data to, to uh, determine the correlations of uh, false alarms uh, or uh, misdetections. Often the assumption is incorrect and it leads to poor tracking performance. And in many cases, the false detections and misdetections are correlated both spatially and temporally. And now I'd like to, I, I, I wrote a paper for uh, the IEEE showing examples with real data how there were dropouts because of physical phenomena that are not just rare, but quite often, which lead to these two things we don't want. A, a significant number of misdetections in a row or a significant number of false detections in a row, i.e. correlated. Birds, which I've gone over a lot in detail. Swarms of bats and insects, too. Real targets whose cross-section distribution over that, over, overlap that of a civil air traffic control radar target environment. And you can go back to uh, view graph 11 for this. I, now, I'm not even touching uh, air-breathing uh, air vehicles that might have um, cross-sections lower than a nose on Piper Cherokee of one meter square. Even so, for military aircraft with reduction techniques, I said that. Sea spikes, the phenomena we went over in the sea clutter lecture. And one of the reasons I emphasized it is the sea spikes will stay for seconds in the radar's coverage and can lead to a false target problem. Rain clutter, when it's, ineffect it's ineffective, uh, when in, excuse me, when ineffective non-coherent integration techniques are employed in the radar, rain clutter is correlated, and you don't get your full value for your non-coherent integration. And I showed that on a graph earlier um, when I was talking about the correlated clutter in Fred Nathanson's um, uh, work that was published in his book. Edge effects on adaptive thresholding, uh, where you have the region at the edge of a rainstorm. They can lead you to false alarms. Use of too few pulses in coherent Doppler processing filter. At least 8 to 10 are necessary in low PRF air traffic control radars. Uh, and uh, the result is high Doppler side lobes and thus poor rain rejection. A ground clutter, or if you have sea fires that rise up enough, you won't see targets. But this is only phenomena dealing with false detections. A ground clutter in regions where the A to D has insufficient dynamic range to allow effective clutter suppression. Now we go to the effect, the problem of mist detections. We can have blind speed effects. Clearly, an air aircraft that's moving tangentially to a radar that doesn't have a clutter map or a multiple PRF filling up that uh, blind speed will will have zero radio velocity, and you know, you clutter will you won't see the target because the clutter will probably be greater than the target. Insufficiently high Doppler velocity filter side lobes to reject rain in conjunction with a good side, good CFAR. You've got a good enough CFAR that you rise up to reject the Doppler side lobes that are hot, too high in, uh, in rain, but you don't see targets that if you had good side lobes, you'd be able to. 
Uh, good CIFAR threshold in regions of significant ground clutter breakthrough. If you have a good CIFAR, it's going to rise up above that mountain and you won't see it. In this case, uh, not initiating, uh, ground clutter breakthrough tends to be in spots. As you look back over the region, uh, way, way back, I showed you uh, a set of a half a dozen or so uh, PPI displays where uh, it was the 0 dB of attenuation and in 10 dB bands up to 60. You could see that when you get up near 50 or 60 dB, the clutter breakthrough is just over a very small area. So if you just don't um, initiate a track in that region where you raise the threshold uh, for clutter breakthrough, then initiate you'll you'll initiate it later. But you won't um, continue the path, uh, continue the track on poor da on data that's not in from the aircraft and in the wrong trajectory. Now we're going to move on to track before detect techniques. It sounds a little weird that you're going to track the aircraft before you detect it. It might really mean, it might really say what we're going to do is we're going to detect an awful lot of data and then we're going to see if all that data from many 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 scans will allow us to crunch and find with hypothesis testing uh, a, a clean target which has consistent range, azimuth, Doppler as a function of time to f form a clean track. And you have to do that many, 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 many times. Now the probability of detection can be, be improved by non-coherently integrating the echoes over multiple scans of the radar. And this is used for weak targets or for a tour to extend the target range. Long resolution time, excuse me, long integration times implies the target may transverse many resolution cells during the integration time. Since the target trajectory is not known ahead of time, nor its speed, um, you've got to hypothesize all possible trajectories. And this is very computationally intensive. But luckily, we've got Moore's Law going for us. And you can put a nice big heavy purpose uh, computer in there uh, nice uh, to do that job these days. And the cor correct trajectory, as I said earlier, is the one that provides a realistic speed and direction of the, t of the type of target being observed or that you wish to observe. And unique maneuvers of the target can limit the viability of this technique. And also, if you're measuring Doppler, you want the Doppler uh, as long to be consistent with the rate of change of range of the trajectory of the target you're observing. So that's another consistency check that you'd put in and track before detect techniques. The target must be tracked before it is detected. And this is also called retrospective detection, long-term integration. And n scans of data, a number of scans for all reasonable trajectory hypotheses are examined. And this is a straightforward but very exhaustive search that can become computationally impractical for very, very large values of n. And dynamic programming techniques have been developed which can reduce the computational load by at least five orders of magnitude. And when I say it, if, if reducing it five orders of magnitude is helpful, that'll let you know that this is a, this goes, this would be going up, uh, with a very high power within. A uh, higher single scan probability of false alarms can be tolerated. We could say set the false alarm rate to 10 to the minus 3 or 2 or whatever rather than 10 to the minus 5 or 6, which tend to give in, oh, air breathing, uh, air traffic control radars, ideally in Gaussian noise, 50 or so scans, 50 or so false alarms per range azimuth Doppler cell. 
Uh, and the use of these techniques uh, significantly increased data processing capability, as I've been saying all along. And that implies is a, a the longer delay time before track initiation is declared. Now, next and lastly, we're, we're going to look at integrated multiple radar tracking. The advantages to integrating radar data from multiple radars, it can greatly improve tracking. You have a great, greater data rate than a single radar. You're less vulnerable to electronic countermeasures, which are pointed in the direction of one radar, and the other, another radar may see it. There, are, because uh, fewer, there be fewer gaps and missing detections, because uh, a mountain might be in the way of one radar but not the other. So we'd have fewer gaps in the coverage. You can fill in multipath nulls, and detection at multiple look angles reduces the chance that you'll be looking at an RCS null. Uh, in, if you're looking at in the null in one direction, it's probably not a null in the other. And, and looking at co-located radars versus ra multiple radar sites, the co-located radars can operate at different frequencies, and that, that can give you a help. Uh, and multiple sites, the tracks from each radar must be correlated with the other radars, and that can be a significant issue. It's, it's, a, it's been a long-standing issue. And the implementation of GPS on each radar site for very accurate site geographic registration has greatly reduced that uh, issue. Now let's summarize part two. A multi-target tracking function has been looked at. And we've looked at uh, the successive scans, their associated form tracks. That was all described, initiation. And then various parts of the tracking process were presented, uh, initiation, association, smoothing of filtering. We looked at both alpha, beta, and uh, filters and common filters lightly. Uh, tracking update and termination. The effect on tracking of correlated misdetections and correlated false alarm was looked at, and the benefits of netting, radar netting were discussed. And the third bullet up reminded me, I'd like to put in a plug for Eli's book. Um, if you're very interested in tracking, uh, I, it's after this set of material that you've seen, this is a superb book, which I would say would be the next process, the next book you'd want to look at. Um, I've covered most of the material lightly from Skolnick's book. If you read his chapter, you get a piece. But Eli's book is a whole book, not that long. Well, it's 500 pages, but relative to, it goes in what I would call um, a gradual, it gradually increases in intellectual complexity. So you can gain a great deal from his book in starting off at the beginning and then when you hit your limit of what you need to, and also he breaks the sub subject up into different pieces. Now in Eli's book, and by the way, I'm assigning one problem from his book. You should get that out from your library. Uh, Eli uses the terms, in Eli's book, he uses the variables F, G, and H for what we use have most of the time in this book and, and from Skolnick's book is alpha, beta, and gamma. And track updating and termination we looked at and the effect of tracking and co of correlated misdetections, false alarms. Okay, now homework problems. I've given you four homework problems from Skolnick's introduction and three problems from Eli's uh, book, and alpha and beta are a G and H filter in his notation. Um, oh, his problems are at the end of his book and not at the end of each chapter. And here are the references. Uh, this is a Lincoln Lab project report. It was done for the FAA by Dave Karp, and uh, one can get that, I believe, from the government. And um, it's in the in the open literature, and here's Eli's book. 
and the paper I presented on uh, correlated misdetections in Fossilon along with the usual suspects here. And acknowledgement from Catherine Mink and Eli Bruckner.